You're on camera. <laughs> Hi, Anna. <laughs> You're very <laughs> weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, Britain. Britain. We're chatting about Britain. Uh, I feel like I blame you for the fact that I got obsessed with Britain as a child. What are your early memories of encountering that music? I was brought up in Suffolk from the age of 11, so essentially the area around Alborough and Snape and Dunwich, where I used to go on holiday. Um, and what captivated me were the huge skies where you have a f fundamentally flat landscape with these huge billowing clouds, which of course is mirrored by the flatness of the sea. And I first encountered Britain's music through school because uh, being in East Suffolk, I was at Stowmarket School, uh, Britain's music was often played and it kind of drip fed into me. So beginning to put together what I was hearing at school, but also the places where this music was composed really brought me into a greater awareness of, of Britain's genius, although at the time I was just too young to understand it. I think I was probably the same in that I think you drip fed that music into my childhood and I wasn't necessarily aware of what I was listening to but I became very kind of aware of that sound world and aware of how much I enjoyed that sound world and how it linked in with our holidays yeah, in yeah. Suffolk and walking along the beach and I think it wasn't actually until I started playing it well, as a harpist so playing the interludes and playing the ceremony of carols that I started to really fall in love with it uh, kind of wholeheartedly and I guess you had the same thing in that you played in performances on the violin as a child. Yeah absolutely so my my first performance of any Britain's work was when I was 14 as part of the York Festival in what would have been 1971. Um, Britain scored Noah's Flood for a professional quartet and a rather large orchestra made up of school children of very varying ability and I was lucky enough to be in the first violins. So um, I was actually right next to the viola player in the professional quartet. And um, it was just an amazing experience. I remember um, we had a lot in rehearsals and, and I, I'd just been trying to learn a partita uh, and I couldn't get the fingering right. And I was only 14 for goodness sake. So I remember sitting there in the kind of the, the break of the practice, just playing as quietly as I could this part of the party to try and get the fingering right. And the professional violinist just came and sat next to me, picked up his violin, and without saying a word, he just played along with me. And there's something incredibly magical when music reduces the barriers between not only age, but ability. It didn't matter that I was only a 14 year old kid just starting out with you know probably a 50 year old professional who'd been at it for years we were just one playing this beautiful music together mm. and that was kind of that was that was how the whole britain experience opened up for me during noah's flood and isn't that also where you actually met britain and i would be eternally jealous of the fact that <laughs> yeah. he touched your shoulder <laughs> yeah that was uncanny um in a bit but in a kind of really lovely way that there's a section in, in Noah's Flood um, where hymns are used, basically. So there's this big storm scene, which kind of climaxes in Eternal Father Strong to say. Uh, and the kids' orchestra are basically soaring away on, on the melody, first violins on the melody of Eternal Father. And it's, it's, you really have to concentrate very hard, well, I, I did. But I was dimly aware of someone who'd come up behind me. And I didn't look up because I had my eyes fixed on the conductor as you do. Um, anyway, we finished Turn of Father Strong to Save and, and, the, and the conductor, Stuart Bedford, said, OK, that was that was really good. Thanks very much, everyone. And this hand comes on my shoulder and I kind of turn around and it's it's Ben Britton and he just smiles at me and said, that's really good. Well done. And toddles off. That's amazing. And like I was left there shaking, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, you win, I think. Let's talk about the interviews themselves now, because, again, that, that was music that like, yeah, yeah. you played me as a child and then I played, uh, I think, with MYO as a harpist, and that sort of really threw me into Britain's music in a completely new yeah. way. I think from the first time I played them, I thought, you know what, I'd love to be slightly more involved because the harpists sit there and actually play very important things in the interludes and quite exposed things, but not that often. Yeah. Um, and so I was sort of sitting there jealous of the first violins who got to play every bar. So I think then doing an, uh, an organ transcription where I get to play absolutely everything seem like quite an, a natural move in a way, but which is your favourite interlude? 
Do you know, I find it really hard to choose between them, Anna. I mean, the thing about Britain, when, when you really get into his music, I did Ceremony of Carols as one of my O-level um, set works uh, for music. When you really get into his music, you realise he's a, just a, such a keen observer of life mm. and he translates that into music. So, you know, Dawn, for example, um, you've got the kind of slow, seething sea. I always think the sea in Peter Grimes it isn't a nice place. It's a kind of malevolent beast, almost crouching, ready. So you get this low murmuring of these slightly sinister waves. And then you get the, the high strings. What the heck are the high strings? I, I always reminds me of seagulls. And if you listen to seagulls wheeling around in the distance, it's this kind of slightly shrieky sound. Mm. So it's almost as if he paints a picture of, a, of a, a, an aubra seascape with this seething sea, the seagulls screeching. And when the brass comes in on this climax, for me it's the sunrise, it's actually this brass, literally brassy light coming up over the sea. And it's just magical. Then you move into Sunday morning. Oh my goodness, what an acute listener. If you know anything about bells, bells don't just sing one note. They have so many overtones that it's often really difficult to work out where the bell is pitched. And if you listen to how, how you know, Britain orchestrates that, you've got horns sustaining the resonance all the way through as a continuous. Then you get these bongs, but it's not one bong. Mm. As you know, it's a chord of bongs that have really weird intervals in them, which is exactly like you'd hear in a bell. But I think that was, uh, for me, uh, trying to recreate it on the organ, that was one of the most uh, challenging moments because it is such an iconic sound and trying to recreate muted horns is something you can't really do on the mm. organ. So I was playing around with all sorts of different things. I probably spent about three weeks just experimenting with those opening chords of Sunday morning. And in the end, the best sort of way of replicating it, or not quite replicating it, but finding an alternative that sort of said the same thing, was sustaining chords in the left hand that overlapped, and then using your feet with a reed stop at the same pitch, yeah, yeah. just to accent the beginning of it. Yeah. And so when you first hear it, you think, hang on a minute, how is that? happening and it almost blends in yeah, as a does. muted chord but that's part of the fun of transcription it's kind of uh, making these little magic tricks where someone goes how on earth have they done that <laughs> Exactly the same with the orchestral version. When you hear it for the first time, it just sounds so natural, you skip over it. But when you analyse it, you realise it's, it's not just one horn, mm. it's several horns all playing at different pitches and also at different 
in the levels of, of sustaining. It's just an incredibly powerful and beautiful, accurate way of doing it. And then you move on to, you know, to, to Moonlight. I just think Moonlight is, is, oh my goodness. Does it send shivers up your spine? Yeah, well, we, so last night we sat and listened to my version for the first time. And it was one of those amazing moments where everyone just went completely, I say everyone, the three of us went completely still and just sat there and got totally kind of sucked into the music. And I, yeah, it paints this amazing sense of openness and space mm. and solitude, but comfortable solitude, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I get the comfort, but you know, again, the sinister scene. Duh, yeah, it's always there. Duh, you know, it's, 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 it's almost as if it's ready to pounce, but just pulls back. Because the the way that the, the the rhythm is, it's not an even even rhythm. It's a surge and recede, a surge and recede, and I think again that's just so observant of what the sea's really like. Mm. But also uh, observant of character, because it, it, it's this. I it, it, happy is the wrong word, but it's a overwhelmingly positive feeling. I would say that I personally get listening to that, and yet it's tinged with the sort of unbearable nature of yeah. that feeling and so it swells up and you kind of don't know whether to smile or cry or yeah. you don't and the music can capture the gray area between yeah. different emotions and i think that's what britain does so beautifully in that movement yeah i totally agree there i mean you have this beautiful climax in moonlight but you don't know whether to laugh or cry yeah, yeah, yeah. because you still got this malevolent sea and you've got this breaking of moonlight upon it which should be sweet, but somehow is tinged with, I don't know, apprehension. <clears throat> you know, one of the things I had to study, as you did when you studied music, is the whole theory behind program music. Mm. <clears throat> and if you accept the kind of paradigm that effectively the sea interludes are kind of quasi programmatic, you know, you think of Vivaldi, Four Seasons, you think of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, where you've got these great evocations of a storm. The storm in Peter Brian's is of a totally different nature. And again, I was trying to work out why. And, and this is just my theory, okay. Here we go. Here we go, here we go. So, you know, the musicologists can shoot me down on this. <laughs> you have in the storm scene in Peter Grimes, in that interlude, these, these seething, um, seething, swirling masses. So he's talking about the storm at sea. So this is obviously a, a sea storm rather than a land storm. You know, really, really clever. But it's somehow a miniature... You know, he could have gone bigger. He could have had huge lightning crashes. He could have gone swirly, swirly with the waves. But it was more than that. Term. It's a technical term. Term. But, you know, it's just this kind of, ah, oh, it's seething. And then you get this, this, this Peach Grimes motif coming out. Mm. This, this weird ninth. Now, why Peach Grimes has a ninth to sing, apart from the fact as a singer, it's a real pig to do. Mm. It almost seems to me as if it's this sort of constant overreaching. Rather than the yeah. octave, it's going a bit further. And that, that for me, is the hint that the storm in the interlude isn't just the storm at sea, it's the storm within Peter Grimes. It's an internal storm. Mm. You know, so that is why I think you get this amazing, swirling, seething sea. And then it stops and you have the Peter Grimes theme coming out in this kind of lyrical few minutes. And then the final chord. So has the storm stopped while Peter Grimes? No, it hasn't. It's just he's gone in on himself. Mm. He's dreaming about his life with Alan, this reaching further than he's ever gone before with this rising night. And then back to reality with the storm. But again, I mean, that because that, that moment you're talking about, this moment is sort of uh, inward looking. Uh, is a harp for Sambo in the, in the original score and it's one of the sort of more exposed moments everyone hears the harp go yeah, yeah. just like that um, just like and that. I, again it was uh, as a harpist sitting there at the organ I was thinking how on earth do I make a harp for Sambo 
translate to the organ because the thing about a harp passando is obviously it sort of doesn't matter about the key because you can set the key with the pedals and then make it a nice smooth passando but on the organ if you're trying to do it sort of the a major basically if you're trying to do that obviously you've got the black notes to contend with yeah yeah and so you have a choice between a smooth passando in the wrong key or a very very fast scale which doesn't sound like a passando in the right key so in the end i had to do this sort of trick to fake it again it's this sort of the magic that you have to weave when you're transcribing. So you start, you, you do the glissando and you catch the first two or three sharps that you yeah, need. Yeah. And then in the left hand at the same time, so you carry on up on just the white notes. But in the left hand, you do an E and then a C sharp and then A and then up to the F sharp. So actually that becomes what the strings do at the same time. So it's um, an acoustic on then basically. Yeah, yeah, and so you hear it and you think, oh, it's an A major-ish glissando. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually that's not what's happening at all. I guess the other side of storm is there's so much going on that as a transcriber you sit there and you think right I have to prioritize mm -hmm. so there was a fascinating process of listening through with the score and thinking what is it which part mm. is absolutely vital to or what three parts are absolutely vital to this particular texture what could I leave out yeah. that isn't going to be missed and then you play around with different things and it's the most fascinating way to understand a composer's orchestration and understand the score better. Yeah. Because you're having to dissect it. And you know, I think with 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 all your arrangements, bringing it down into the smaller scale from an orchestra onto one instrument, albeit an organ which has you know quite a wide range of, of tone colour, <clears throat> inevitably the tonal range is going to be different. And that's why I think it works so well, because <clears throat> it forces you to simplify what you're hearing, mm. because it, it in itself has been condensed down to its its quintessential elements, its, its most fundamental elements, mm. which is why I think it works so so, so brilliantly. <laughs> question as a listener because obviously you've heard the normal interludes normal interludes many many times how did you find it suddenly hearing it on the organ because I think it's quite difficult for me to answer that question because I think when I listen both when I listen to the orchestral version and when I listen to the organ version I kind of hear it in quite a physical way because mm. I'm remembering yeah. the f sensation of playing it and I'm sort of uh, almost embodying that when I hear it so I think it's quite difficult for me to listen impartially I guess it's, in, it's a fundamental question of psychoacoustics. I mean, do we ever hear for the second time the same way as we've heard from the first time? Yeah. We've always got the memory. I mean, I can't, <clears throat> I can't hear Noah's Flood without remembering what it was like in 1971, which is 50 years ago. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible times, a lifetime. But I still have that kind of physical memory of being hot and sweaty in the orchestra pit, my vibe, my shoulder aching, you know my head aching, um, and all the kind of pressure of performing at the Albury Festival when you're only 14. So that tinges how I hear it. And mm. I think with the sea interludes, at the moment, I've not yet been able to switch off my memory of the orchestral version to hear the organ version in its purity. And I think what will be really interesting is to come across people who've never heard the orchestral version and mm. ask them to feedback from the, the, the organ transcription. Mm. Because I think part of it as well, when you're transcribing, is thinking, do I want to try and replicate the orchestral version as accurately as possible? Yeah. Which um, can involve acrobatics, for want of a better word, on the organ. Or do I want to think about how it might have sounded were it an organ piece? And I think I 
started off going to the former and then decided to uh, pursue the latter because I feel, I mean, Britain did write a couple of organ pieces, not very many, but I thought actually this, this music does translate quite mm. naturally onto the organ if you're willing to make a couple of compromises. Yeah. And so it, Sunday morning in particular, it really does just feel like an organ piece. And then when I go back and listen to orchestral one, I think, this isn't right, it's an organ piece, what's going on? What are those flutes doing? It's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. I think that, uh, the build up, um, sort of after the first section of Sunday morning when it comes back and you get the da 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. da 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 and then it builds up to the recap of the tune. That, the first time I played it, because I, when I was doing the transcription, I did it at home on my little instrument, working out the notes, um, and sort of worked it out in theory, and then I got to take it to the Ely instrument and really work out the nitty-gritty of how it's going to work. Yeah. So I had this amazing moment when I had sort of set everything up from the organ and thought, I'm just going to try running it and see what happens. And that build-up, I just had the biggest grin on my face because it was as if this thing that had just been in my head for six months was suddenly coming to life. And all those days, all those years, sitting as a harpist in an orchestra, yeah. watching the strings do that build-up, I was suddenly there doing it. And it was just me in a massive building, filling it with sound and completely embodying some of my favourite music. It was the most extraordinary feeling. Thank you. 